what a happiness. These are occasions are always uh, the top word is happy. Uh, so many kindred spirits. So I know you're kindred, or you wouldn't be here. And friends all all over the place. Some new. Uh, it's a great pleasure. Now, uh, I was asked uh, in the moments before we came to order, uh, how would you like to be introduced? And I said, uh, well, folks, here's Houston Smith, and <laughs> let it go. Uh, I said, anything more you say takes time away from me. <laughs> well, Well, that didn't go very well. So I had a backup. I said, OK, here's my alternative. Uh, let me introduce myself. And that flew. And so uh, one of the reasons I like to introduce myself is that Introductions always have so much hype in them. I mean, that's the nature of the game. Uh, uh, who's going to ever, ever say, well, ladies and gentlemen, here is Professor Smith. He's not much, but he was the best our honorarium could afford. <laughs> you know? That doesn't go. Uh, and so uh, those uh, superlatives uh, really work against me. One of the things I've been trying to do recently is to reduce the size of my ego <laughs> and lavish introductions just uh, work against that. Uh, I'm Houston Smith. I was born in traditional China of uh, Methodist missionary parent. And um, <clears throat> I, uh, from as far back as I can remember, my guiding star, what I wanted to do most in my life, was to know the truth with a capital T. Uh, meaning by that, the big picture, the widest angle lens we could get on the nature of ultimate reality. Now, uh, being in Podunk, China, only uh, foreigners in this town, a tight nuclear family. Why, I grew up thinking that the Bible gives us the biggest picture. And that held in place till I came over to this country for college. And then, uh, with all the dynamism of America and so on, uh, I got interested in philosophy because I realized the Bible speaks only to one tradition and there are other traditions. And so I turned to philosophy, that they might, it might give me the biggest picture. After uh, getting my doctorate at the University of Chicago in philosophy, and starting to teach, I finally realized that, the, that philosophy does not give us the picture because its blinders are very heavy. At that time, it was uh, dominated by science, and philosophy was really inside science. And science was the big picture. 
And that held in place until one night, uh, a little bit before I got my degree, uh, I came upon um, my first book on mysticism. Uh, that night uh, was the only night I had read, read all night long. And as dawn was breaking and I closed the book, that science as the big picture, that view had collapsed like a house of cards. And the mystic view of reality uh, took its place and it has held in place ever since. People sometimes ask me, why are you a Christian? And the real answer is because I was born that way. And that was my upbringing, my nurturing, and in my case, it took. But if I were to go beyond that, uh, I can say I'm a Christian because I believe in the forgiveness of sin. And the older I grow, the more I realize how much forgiveness I uh, need. Because partly willfully and partly unconsciously, I've given a lot of pain to people along the way. And I need forgiveness. And uh, I always find on occasions like this, uh, that it's well to uh, look at the description in uh, the program because um, <laughs> those few sentences are the only thing that has brought us together. Uh, this is the contract, so to speak, and I do take responsibility for this. And so it's good to refresh my mind and so that I will hew to what I said I would say. Otherwise, I could be guilty of breach of contract. So <laughs> here it is. Spinning off from the way things are. My latest book title. There were copies in the bookstore. I don't know if there are any now. Uh, Phil Cousineau's skillfully edited summation of Smith's lifelong search for the real. Now, let me pause there for a moment. Uh, in my career, there have been three things that just seemed like they dropped out of heaven and fell in my lap. I didn't work for them, they just came. The first was uh, the early 1960s, I was researching Tibetan Buddhism in a monastery, and on the full moon night in October, uh, Gyuta Monastery, high in the foothill of the Himalayas, uh, in three o'clock in the morning, there broke over my ear, uh, the first Western ear to hear this sound, the holiest sound I have ever heard, uh, which uh, turned out, when I brought it back to the West, to be uh, a mode of chanting, a vocal phenomena that the West had no idea the throat was capable of, and it introduced a new word into the lexicography of musicology, multiphonic chanting a first, a third, and a fifth, a dominant chord 
everything coming out of uh, one Larry. Uh, OK, that was the first thing. The second thing that fell in my lap is that Bill Moyer, the phone rang. And the voice said, this is Bill Moyer. Uh, I read your uh, religions of man, now the world's religions, uh, when I was uh, in seminary in uh, Texas. And I vowed on the spot that I was going to meet you someday. And the time has come that I want to pursue that vow. And that led, as you may know, uh, to Bill Moyer's five-part uh, PBS series, The Wisdom of Faith with Houston Smith. Again, it just dropped into my lap. And the third was this current book, latest book, The Way Things Are. Now, uh, through my career, uh, the university has honored me. Uh, they have um, given me 14 honorary degrees. They use my books and so on. I have no complaint, but we live out of our fears rather than our faith. Take note, don't do that but we tend to do that. And so I had a little fear that I was really dismissed by my colleague as a popularizer. In French, vulgarateur. It's an honor. It's an honored position, honored vocation. Here, no vulgar. Vulgar. And I'm afraid that I've been dismissed by my colleague. And it just flicked through my mind wouldn't it be nice if one of my books were published by a university press? Three weeks later, the telephone rang. Houston Smith? Yes. This is Reed Malcolm. Uh, the director of the University California Press. We've been tracking you. We want to bring out a book on you. Uh, now, we know you're busy and you, you can't just write a book for us, but how about this? We are tracking you. We have found that you have given 40, uh, 35 interviews that have crested into print. And we've scanned them. They're all lying on my desk. How uh, would we have your permission uh, to uh, contract for an editor? And he mentioned the name of Phil Cousineau, the leading biographer of uh, Joseph Campbell. Uh, Splendid man, and uh, he would be interested in taking this on, editing those interviews, cutting out all the redundancies, ordering them in a kind of sequence. And, uh, you know, the book was almost done. <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> Six months of hard work lay ahead of Phil Kuzana, but I just sat back for the ride. Buddhism is uh, the Dharmakaya vow, uh, which is the story of a person who, through innumerable incarnation, uh, worked their way up to the uh, being this last incarnation. And they are on the cusp 
of nirvana, uh, eternal bliss. And just as they're about to step over into that endless and be rid of this sorry world, uh, the Bodhisattva uh, swivels around and plants the lifted leg back in this world, vowing that he will not enter nirvana until, as the phrase goes, the grass itself is enlightened. Now, I pick up with our contract. Okay. <laughs> Spinning off from the way things are, Smith will point out This isn't hype, it's true, I'm going to do it. Smith will point out the way things really are. In contrast to the way pundit of modernity would have us think they are. Somewhat important, isn't it? And that's what I intend uh, to do. All right, now to pick up. Houston claims no originality for what he says. He will be conveying the winnowed wisdom of the human race uh, as reported by uh, the spiritual giants throughout history. That's what I've done and spent my life in. I sometimes uh, pull it together and refer to it as the winnowed wisdom of the human race, uh, the wisdom tradition. Now, quickly, let me in insert. Uh, not everything in them is wise. Uh, natural science has retired their view of the physical universe permanently, and uh, also, patterns for so social relationship, they mostly picked up the mores of their time. Uh, and we live in different times. And so, uh, I don't thumb through the Bhagavad Gita, the Tao Te Ching, the Bible, the Quran, uh, for patterns of human relation. Uh, they have caste, uh, they have slavery, and uh, they have subordination of women and so on, and those are not why. So in those two areas, the physical universe and uh, our patterns of social relationships, uh, we one of the good things about modernity is we live in a time of the fairness revolution. Uh, we have so far to go yet uh, that it's too early to congratulate ourselves, but at least we see we have to work on race relationship, uh, gender relationship, lifestyle, things like that. Okay, so uh, let's not be confused. We push those aside, but what remain? The vision of the nature of ultimate reality. And on that score, I find nothing in modernity or anywhere else that rivals that wisdom 
uh, of these great tradition, and it is um, reinforced that tradition by the by independent verification. The various great traditions grew up mostly in cocoons, in isolation, and yet at the top, they all converge in two things. What is the nature of ultimate reality? And second, how can we best comport our lives in that big picture. And that's what has been uh, the steady object of my uh, career. It's very risky as a comparativist, as I am, uh, playing the field to say, one religion has something that the others don't because usually you can find echoes of it everywhere. Uh, but I stick my neck out and say, uh, in no other tradition do I find a band of men with a few women in it, the prophet. These people, uh, by the way, our word prophet is misunderstood. Uh, we think of a prophet as somebody who foresees the future, uh, but that's not right. Etymologically, pro is for, and thesis is for, the root for speak. A prophet speaks for, and speaks for God. The great goal in human uh, history occurred in the 16th, 17th century in uh, Western uh, Europe uh, with what we call the scientific revolution. Now, we have to look at that, squint at it pretty carefully, because it, science which centers in the controlled experiment uh, offered proof. And that's what history did not have. They could have conversion among the same and so on, but they couldn't prove it. But science can prove its claim. And that proof of uh, those proofs quickly accumulated in pouring out benefits. Goods could be multiply, drudgery reduce, washing machines, microwave, and the like, and life expectancy uh, extended. Now, these are no small benefits, and they ravished the modern world, modern mind, and set in place uh, the modern scenario, which I'm going to come to in just a moment. Now, the reason this is important for us is uh, that uh, this scenario, its big picture, uh, drew the shades down over this vision of ultimate reality that the wisdom traditions had put in place. Uh, it's like as if we were in a bungalow uh, with a picture window 
looking out on the Himalayan range, one of the most gorgeous sights my eyes have ever seen. And have everybody, anybody here seen that? Magnificent. And, but it's like the, the scientific method uh, pull the window shades down, so now looking at the window, all we can see is the ground on which this bungalow stands. And that symbolizes the physical universe. I'll give credit where credit is due. It has shown that ground to be awesome beyond all belief. But it is not Mount Everest. Now, that's the mistake of modernity. And uh, it's important that we see that uh, because the barons of the media are still caught in that modern scenario. However, I'm here to bring good news. Uh, by the way, not about the news of the day. That's disastrous. And I'm not an optimist. But about uh, the big picture, we stand in the most promising time that Western people have for 300 years to re pull up the shade and uh, proclaim and ask people to look at Mount Everest. And the reason our times are so promising is that the modern scenario, its big picture, has worn thin. And I'm going to document this. The uh, modern scenario has three parts. Uh, science is a royal road to truth, empirical science. Second, technology, the spin-off of science is the cornucopia that will pour out the things that will bring the good life. And third, because that cornucopia is getting bit, bigger with every discovery, pouring out more and more, the bottom line is progress. Indefinite, in ongoing, non-ending progress. Hinduism, it's the four yogas. That uh, there are four paths to God through knowing God, uh, through loving God, uh, through serving God, and through meditation. Uh, none is better than the others, but we each have our strong suit, and it behooves us uh, to lead with our strong suit, just as in a uh, pack of cards, game of cards. Now, I said this scenario is growing thin. Let's look at it. Read it backward. Progress. The 20th century is the most horrendous century of all human history. 160 million human beings uh, slaughtered by their own kind. More 
starvation in every decade of the 20th century than in all the centuries that led up to the 20th century. The gap between the rich and the poor, never greater, and it keeps uh, increasing all the time. Now, my friend, nobody can look at that century uh, honestly, accurately, and continue to believe in progress. Is this progress? Okay. Second, let's go to technology. Sure, the benefits keep pouring out, but what was not noticed is they, they concern only the physical aspect of life. Uh, yes, science, technology, and science can uh, tell us how we can live longer. It cannot say one word about whether that's worthwhile living longer or uh, uh, what would make it, what we can do to make those added years worthwhile. Zero, not one thing. And now we come, we've taken care of progress, we've taken care of technology, now science. What was not noticed for 300 years, and my friends, uh, this is more than interesting, it's riveting. A little slip between the cup and the lip, and nobody noticed it. Here is the slip. Science, with its controlled experiment, uh, can deal, is the technical word is empirical. That means it is extrapolated from our physical senses, mostly what we can see, as enlarged by telescopes, uh, electron microscope, but it all comes down to what we can see. Now, my friend, think about this. Uh, I don't care if you think I'm full of myself and this is chutzpah, but I'll bet I'm telling you things you haven't heard before. And the reason is that they have only recently dawned on me, and I haven't heard this before. All right, empiricism. Uh, what our physical senses can deliver. Now, our physical senses are important for sure, but they're not our only senses. Uh, we have thoughts, and we have feeling, and our physical senses don't reveal that to us. Nobody has ever seen a thought. Nobody has ever seen a feeling. And yet, that's where our lived lives are. So that whole dimension of life is not approached uh, or dealt with by 
sign. We can visualize it this way, in this horizontal line, symbolizing faith. The vertical line symbolizes worth, superior and inferior. And uh, science cannot touch it. That's why I say that modernity, vectored by this scenario, uh, is played out. And thinkers are beginning to see this more and more every year, every decade, but we have a huge drag of cultural lag, uh, the backward pull of the outgrown good. So it's going to take some time uh, for the general public, uh, led by the uh, media baron, for what I'm telling you now to sink down into our general consciousness. Islam is marvelous. Uh, I was for, especially the, the Sufi. Uh, of course, now uh, they're fanatics and dogmatists and fundamentalists in both Christianity and Islam. And they're, uh, I started to say, doing no end of mischief, but really they're creating hell. Uh, not too much to say that, but uh, that's the news of the day uh, as I was speaking this morning. The news of eternity is uh, the, uh, the Quran and Islam is a religion of peace. Their salutation, you know, is assalamu alaikum, meaning peace be on you. When we meet somebody, we say, how are you? <laughs> they say, peace be upon you. And that is the underlying theme. We live in a very dangerous world. This is the news of the day. And uh, we are getting very little help on how uh, to deal with that. Uh, religion has just come roaring into public life. Uh, because we're at war. And now uh, I know no more about politics. I have my deep convictions, but that's not relevant here. No, no more than any of you. But I do I have dealt with religion. And I'll give you uh, axiomatically what happened when nations go to war. Uh, people at war have to win. That's the top priority, avoid defeat. And that requires power. What is the greatest power in the universe? God. So, we have to tap into that power and see that it's channeled to us. Now, this is axiomatic, never mind who's at war and so on. And uh, in our present conflict between uh, Christianity, or if you want to say uh, the 
American or uh, way of life against Islam. Uh, the rhetoric is exactly the same on both sides. You just mirror image of one another. Another cartoon, uh, an announcer in the, e in the evening news says, today uh, a uh, small group of virtuous people were viciously attacked by mobs of evil people. And of course, the point of the cartoon is it didn't, doesn't identify who are the good people, who are the evil people. It's all scripted. You can just plug in your name. And <clears throat> here's the next axiomatic thing. Claiming God on your side uh, entails demonizing the enemy. A friend of mine, Sam Kane, some of you may know him, has tracked this. He had a, a, a video that came out after World War II sometime on images of the enemy, and it went back to uh, World War I, he did his research and had visual. In World War I, it was the Krauts, and they're very vicious. In World War II, yes, there are the Krauts, but there are also the Jeff, and these horrendous faces of the yellow peril. And now he's updating it with the images of Islam. Uh, these are all posters visualized, and uh, I forget whether it's already uh, near enough completion to be scheduled uh, to show on PBS. Uh, all right, uh, that is the news of the day. We are living on the top of a volcano and it could, it's already, the world is in flame. And you know, here it's such a beautiful uh, environment, lovely people, uh, good food and so on. It's easy to forget the desperation in the world. And that's what uh, we must not just um, slack off and enjoy our private lives and our affluence and our good friends. We should have this, as uh, my teacher said, infinite service to all things present and infinite responsibility to all things future, including most importantly, the future of our planet. Absolute perfection reign. Now, you know, I can just almost, well, I can't read your mind, but other groups I could read. What? This guy's off the wall or off his rocker. How can you square that with the daily news? Disaster, disaster, horrendous, horrendous. My friend, it can be done. And the great giants of the wisdom tradition have done it. But that cannot, how you make that uh, connection with evil 
and amps uh, cannot be delivered in sound bites. That requires a seminar to work that one through. No, I'm not an optimist, uh, but I am hopeful. And uh, the difference is that an optimist uh, believes that they can psych out the future and everything going, is going to end well. Uh, I'm not at all sure that that is the case, but I am hopeful in the sense that uh, if we give everything we've got to coping with the problem of the present, that will be a meaningful act, whatever happens in the future. Hope comes in from a different angle. It is the conviction that if we give everything we have to our present struggle, those will be meaningful acts. And he threw in an analogy. A family uh, has a severely retarded child. Is it optimistic that that child will become normal or even improve substantially? No, it faces the fact it probably will not improve very much. However, that does not keep the family from pouring its love and nurturance and care on that child. I think I reach for what one of my teachers said to me. Uh, he put it in a very nice formula. He said, uh, you should cultivate infinite gratitude for all things past, uh, infinite service for all things present, infinite responsibility for all things future. And I can do no better than my teacher in saying that. And in gratitude for that, uh, we should bear one another's burden. Well, I'm not a scientist, so I simply listen on that sort. But I can tell you what the wisdom traditions say, and it's very germane to what I've said. In this flip, from the traditional wisdom grounded society to modernity, consciousness suffered a huge blow. Because it can, you, can, you can't see it. And uh, uh, two of the great mistakes of modernity is to say that matter is the fundamental reality in the universe. Dead raw. All of the wisdom tradition, everybody took it for granted that consciousness is the fundamental reality. Uh, and note this, we can learn from science uh, some very excellent analogy. Science has shown us that matter cannot be annihilated. It can 
be converted from one form to another. Uh, matter, energy, energy back, you cannot annihilate it. Now look what follows. If consciousness is fundamental, you cannot annihilate that. Uh, it can change the content. A little bit like a television screen. It's like the light that is always there and makes possible the images. But if consciousness has, I'm absolutely convinced they're right, uh, is basic, it can change the script, I mean the visuals, like on the television, but the light never goes out. And let me tell you, uh, you are all immortal. Whether you want to be or not. <laughs> because there's some kickers in there, depending on how you live, it's not going to be all hunky-dory. But uh, you, the pictures will never stop. Uh, I've been blessed by having uh, many very good friends and one of them was Aldous Huxley, a uh, magisterial mind, uh, one of the best novelists of the 20th century. And I was very close to him for a long time and chauffeured him on uh, many of his evening lectures. And as we were coming back from one, he turned to me and he said, Houston, uh, you know, it's a little bit embarrassing to have devoted one's entire life to the human condition and find that one has uh, really nothing more to say to people than try to be a little bit kinder. No self is best if we take self in the term in terms of the ego and to transcend one's ego is the best. And back to Bill Moyer the one thing I said in those five hours that drew the most flack was when I said right out loud under questioning from Bill, uh, are there fully enlightened being in the human body? Is that possible? And I flatly said, no. Well, it's an asymptotic curve. You can and should, we all should work towards reducing the ego as much as possible. But uh, I do not think it's possible to bring it down to zero. You should have seen the mail. I mean. You ought to meet my guru, Mayor Baba or Sai Baba or whoever. Uh, but I stick by my gun. If uh, Jesus said, why call it thou me good? No, it thou not that there is only one good, the Father. If that's what Jesus said, it's good enough for me.